Remain standing as we read God's word together. We're in Matthew chapter 5. And we are looking at verses 9 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Uh, Sorry. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. Your reward in heaven is great. Sorry, I said that wrong, guys. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for eyes of faith as we look upon your word. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is preaching to all of our hearts, Lord. Father, I pray that you give us wisdom and discernment from on high, and that we are edified today through the reading of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. It is fitting by God's sovereignty that we fall upon this section of Scripture this specific week. It's an odd thing to discuss peace and peacemaking during times of great aggression and possibly, most definitely, times of great treason. When we began the Sermon on the Mount, I addressed that we all read this section way too quickly, and we don't reflect on what these words mean. And the same is true of here and now. But when we consider peacemaking, what does that look like? Whoa, what was that? Further, (laughs) I don't know what that was. Further, we look at the context. What does peacemaking look like in the midst of persecution? That's the context of what we're looking at. The two are connected. All of what we are looking at and, and, and all of this that we are looking at, it's connected. But we tend to isolate these verses. These verses are meant to be read together, but we have this tendency to isolate these verses. Peacemakers, the makers of peace. In the midst of persecution, that wind is so strong today. My goodness. Did you even, did you blow away a little bit on your way here? Were you, oh. How about you guys? Did you're rocking? Oof. Maybe that's just what happened. Maybe your guys' nitro's on its side. Peacemakers, the makers of peace in the midst of persecution. And what do we know about peace? When one reads these verses, they assume peace from wartime. They assume to be conflict resolutions. That's what they're thinking about. But to be persecuted is obviously, not a, is obviously a sign that peace is not is not what's taking place there. We're talking about peace and persecution at the exact same time. What is this concept of peace that Jesus is talking about? Persecution is something the church has always faced. It is the great mark of Christianity. It's not the be-all, end-all evidence, but it's the great mark of Christianity, persecution. We have watched history's greatest peacemakers receive persecution. We see it with Stephen in the book of Acts. He was not causing violence. Violence was done to him. We see Paul under great persecution. At one point, we see Paul doing the persecuting. But we see Paul endure great persecution. He was not the aggressor. He was not committing violent acts against the people who were persecuting him. We know that John has faced this. We know that Peter has faced this. And then we look at all the greats throughout history. They endured difficult persecution that, frankly, I don't think 
most of the Americans in the American Christian church can withstand. Pastors today can't even handle the concept of not even being liked. At the Council of Nicaea, the council was the first time Christians were really gathered together free from persecution. Uh, this was after Constantine defeated his foe, and, 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 and now he was the emperor of Rome. And part of his great plan was to uh, make Rome great again, if I can use a phrase. That's what, but it, honestly, that's what it was, was to make Rome great again, a great empire again. And that he would establish that by, he would do this by establishing the Christian God as the God of the Roman Empire. That was going to be their, their deity. For Constantine, he looked and he said, look, our nation was great at one point. They honored all these other gods but that's not working for Rome anymore, so maybe we should try and honor the God of the Christians. And if maybe if we make the God of the Christians the God of our culture, then we can be this great empire once again. And so Christians were gathered. It was not controlled by Constantine, but it was under his orders and under his authority to grant these Christians a safe place to make an official statement of faith. And at this council, many of the faithful ones still had the physical marks of persecution on them. They still had the marks, the scars, as they were gathered under freedom for the very first time. It was the first time for Christianity in 300 years. Did the Council of Nicaea put an end to persecution? Absolutely not. No. No. Not only did it not put an end to it, but the church has forgotten its Nicene roots quickly after that, and they went on with the whims of the culture, much like how the church is doing today. And so they have adopted secular paganism into their, into their worship, into their Christian worship, and over time you have what we call Roman Catholicism. It is a blend of the pagan culture of, of, of the Roman culture in that time and the blend of Christianity, and that's what you got. Pagans were now in this empire where the God of the Christian Bible was now the head of, of their religion. Here's all these pagans. They, they, they want to be involved, but how do I fit in with all this? And eventually the church is going like, well, you know what? That's not this goddess, Ishtar or whatever. It's Mary, and she's holding baby Jesus. And slowly it became saint worship, slowly a little bit surely, we exchanged pagan worship for saint worship. And then the gospel was not going forth. The gospel was no longer the center of the churches. It was no longer the center message. And anyone who attempted to make the gospel the core of their message, anyone who came and said, hey, you know what? What we're reading about, it's not true. What we're hearing about from the church, the message we're getting out of these pages is that we are justified by our faith in Christ, that we are not justified by our works. We're not the ones who are doing this, but it's by his works. Execution, if you said something like that. Burned at the stake. These men were killed for saying that the work of salvation was 100% the work of Christ. Killed for it. Rome executed people because Rome has a sovereign view of man and not a sovereign view of God. It's within your control. You are the one who's in charge. This, of course, wasn't held by Luther and Luther became a, that one of the first powerful influence. He was not the first one, but he gained a lot of ground on his doctrine of justification by faith alone because he was protected. There was people who were looking after him that were guarding his life. And this is what made him a powerful voice in history because he had, he had powerful people who were protecting him. But he too had a face his own persecution in that day. They did try to hunt him down and kill him. He did have to hide away for a long time. During that time, he translated the New Testament into German so the German people can have the scriptures in their own language. Before that, he did have to stand before the authorities and plead his case. 
Persecution goes on until this very day, and we will discuss it more later, but you should know that right now we have brothers and sisters in other countries who are getting their throats cut and their heads cut off for their profession of faith in Christ. Now, not ancient history, that's taking place right now in other countries. Our family. It is those types of persecutions that we in this country have never had to endure. And so many in our country have the eschatological view that says, yeah, but that time, that time will come. But the scriptures reveal to us that this persecution is always present. The persecution is always present. It's always there. It never went away. We're just very blessed people. And our blessings have blinded us from the realities of what takes place. So we're going to continue our study, and we're actually going to bring a conclusion to the Beatitudes today. It's not a conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. It's just a conclusion to the Beatitudes, these little quick statements. Really, it's an outline of the Christian life. So let's look a little bit closer at God's Word and gain a better understanding. Look at verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now this verse requires context. First, we cannot forget the we can't forget verses one through eight when we are looking at verse nine. You do not get to open up the pages of Scripture, look at the sermon from our Lord, and begin immediately at verse nine and say that's the starting point, and then end at verse nine as well, as so many want to do. We're following a series here, a series of statements. So we need to consider those who are poor in spirit. Those are the same ones that are at work in this, this series of, of this, this Beatitudes. It's the same person that Christ is, is describing. Being poor in spirit is looking at the poor spiritual condition you are in. It's a miracle from God himself when you realize the spiritual condition you are in. When we stop and see that we are the ones who are the workers of evil, that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior, that revelation about ourselves didn't come from us because we are oh so smart. That revelation came to us as a gift from God. The same people who are poor in spirit mourn over their spiritual poor condition. They mourn over it. The same ones in response take on a gentle personality, a meek attitude. This is an attitude that develops over time. Remember, meek is not weak. You begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, and you will be satisfied in that righteousness because it's not a righteousness of your own doing, but it's a righteousness that Christ provides for us. Those same people begin to practice biblical mercy, a holy mercy. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Not that we are in a sinless state, but pure in heart knows the impurities within our hearts, recognizes our own impurities, and is in constant repentance for those impurities. And so the first rule of context is making sure that we're keeping the verses in line, that we are considering the surrounding words around verse 9. The second thing we have to consider is historical context. The Jews regarded the Gentile nations with bitter contempt. They hated the Gentile nations. It was their understanding that the Messiah would come and bring a series of warlike attacks on all these nations that were against uh, against them until those nations were destroyed or until those nations subjected themselves to the nation of Israel that was their view and so here's this one who's who, here's this one who people are believing this could be the messiah and he says blessed are the peacemakers well, this is an entirely different message than what these people were used to hearing. It's, 
always easy for us to read things like this, to read blessed are the peacemakers, and we say, oh yes, you know, that sounds so good, that sounds so nice, and well, man, we got such a good Messiah, he wants peacemaking, but we never put ourselves in the shoes of the first century Jews who were hearing this message for the very first time. So this was a very shocking statement for Jewish people to hear. Definitely got their attention. What? Blessed are who? It's a very new thing for the Jewish people to hear. But how consistent it is with Matthew's message already because he's already told us in the birth narrative, he describes, he tells us, peace on earth and goodwill toward man. This Messiah didn't come to rise up against other nations. This Messiah came to call other nations to himself. Now we have to understand that blessed is the peacemaker it has more to do with the conduct of man rather than the character of man. Though the logical order would have to be that the peacemaker must have a peaceable spirit themselves. So we can't ignore the character altogether. But one thing is absolutely certain. Verse 9, the peacemaker is related to those who recognize that they were poor in spirit. And so we need to have the God of peace with us. You remember we talked about that? The scriptures call God the God of peace. The peacemakers are only those who have entered into the peace with Christ through the blood of the Lamb. If you have entered into this peace, which Christ made possible by his blood that he did on the cross, that he shed on the cross, then, then you are a peacemaker. But if you are not one of these people, if you have not received the blood of Christ, if you have not received Christ in faith, you are not one of these peacemakers because you are still hostile towards God. You're not a peacemaker. You're a war maker. You are still declaring war on God. We also need to recognize the battleground that we are on when, when we see this. And the battleground that we are on is one of sin. Sin was brought into this world. And we have to recognize the great destruction that sin has done to our world. Understand that the very reason why peacemakers are needed, or the very reason why peacemakers exist, is because of sin itself. Because of the hostility that sin has created in our world. Because of the ugliness that sin has created in our world. Because of the violence that sin has created in our world. Otherwise, there will be no need for peacemakers at all. We would have no need for peacemakers if sin was not the motivating force against God. The next thing we need to recognize is that the sensation of peace that we have comes from our relationship that we have with the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself. And what develops within our hearts is, is what we we, we begin to regard our fellow man with sincere benevolence. So we receive Christ. We realize we have been shown great mercy. We realize that we have been shown great grace. And we realize that we now have peace with God. And then we begin to regard our fellow man with sincere benevolence. This begins our desire to look after their best interest, even when they don't know it is their best interest. We are looking after their best interest. Not just here and now today, but we're looking at their best interest when we die and what takes place after we die. Therefore, it is within our best interest to live peaceably among other people so we can bring them this real peace. 
The unbelieving world will never know the true and rich blessing they have by having Christians present in this world. The unbelieving world will never know that everything they have that is good is because God's church is still here. That God's people are still here. And it's multiple things, too. It's not just here and now because we bring the presence of the Holy Spirit wherever we go, but the things that our people, we belong to the people of God, the things our people have invented and created. And the things that we have invented and created are the very things that the haters of God use now to wage war against God. You know how many scientists were believers in God? That their whole world view is what was pushing their scientific study? It is because of Christianity that a society like ours and a culture like ours was able to grow, historically. To go from being poor settlers to the most powerful nation and the richest nation in the world is not done by sheer willpower. The entire world is indebted to the presence of the followers of Christ, and they don't know it. Indebted to the followers of Christ. It's the gutters, by the way. I just realized what it was. It's the gutters. Oh, you got, we got shingles coming off? No boy, no. <clears throat> All right. Not going to think about another project. Another honey, honey do, honeydew list thing. Another chore. It's not just the presence of God's people. It's the faithfulness of God's people. Historically, God's people, they weren't, they weren't people who sat still. They were very active people. They didn't just sit still. They were, they were workers. They were, they were builders, and that's what they did. They worked, and they built. They didn't just take the beating from the wicked. They stood up, and they stood firm. They built an entire nation. They were the ones that came up with the idea of what we call public education right now. It was not the same concept, but it was the idea that we will have an educated culture so they can read the Word of God for themselves. We will provide good health care because God's people are to look after that. All of this stuff has been greatly corrupted. Everything that the Christians work so hard to build a better culture, a better society, has now been taken over by the haters of God and has been greatly corrupted. But historically, they did not take a beating from wicked men, but they stood up and they stood firm. Contrary to those who now avoid getting involved. Contrary to the to the preachers who claim, you know, I'm just trying to stay indifferent here. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to talk about these things. I just want to remain indifferent. One historical writer called this type of behavior from the followers of Christ. He said, it is selfishness and cowardice. I agree. To not speak up, to not take a stand against these people who are raging war against God and to say, I want to remain indifferent, that is selfishness and that is cowardice. That is not peace. The faithful doers of righteousness never had an attitude of peace at any price. And that's the attitude that we are starting to see from our ministers. I want to remain out of this. I want to remain indifferent peace at any price, that was never the attitude of God's people. They knew, they knew it would be a dangerous task. Paul knew he was facing a dangerous task. But they also knew that that attitude was actually the greatest opponent against peace. Selfishness and cowardice and trying to remain indifferent and peace at any cost. 
That's a fancy word for the haters of God taking over. They will claim that they are remaining indifferent, but their indifference speak volumes. And they will claim that they are remaining indifferent for the sake of peace, but they're call, it's peace at any price. This is a false peace. As Arthur Pink called it, a peace unworthy to be called peace at all. And there's a reason for that. James 3.17. James 3.17 says this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. In that verse, we get a little message about peace. But what does this verse say comes first? It is first pure. Pure. So peace is not accomplished at the expense of righteousness. Peace is not accomplished by allowing wickedness because it is always first pure, which lines up exactly, exactly with the order of the Beatitudes that we are reading from Jesus. Because what is stated before peacemaker? That we must first be pure of heart. There's that purity again before peace. Hebrews 12, cha uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Literally, to pursue peace with all men and holiness. To pursue peace with all men and righteousness. So we don't sacrifice on what is pure. We don't sacrifice on what is holy. That must come first. We must uphold righteousness. We must uphold holiness. We don't allow this wickedness to have control for the sake of peace because that is not peacemaking. And if we look at James correctly, who is the brother of Jesus, and the writer of Hebrews, and we got Jesus himself emphasizing holiness, purity before peace, that tells us something. We are to avoid all the needless occasions of strife. There are so many needless occasions of strife. We don't have to get involved with every single argument. We don't have to argue for the sake of arguing. We don't have to have an opinion on every little detail. But we can never do it at the expense of sacrificing truth compromising our principles or forsaking our duty to Christ himself. Which is what we are seeing take place. Compromising on truth, on our principles, and our duty to Christ. So we want to be peaceful people to our best ability. That's what the scriptures are telling us. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If possible, within your power, be at peace with men. And doing our best to be at peace with all men is going to be our greatest tool in gospel proclamation. Did you know that? Being at peace with all men will be our greatest ally. It's going to be the greatest tool you will have to get people to listen to you and the gospel message that you bring. People will meet us with hostility, and sometimes you kind of have to calm that hostility down. Hey, you know what? I just want to have a conversation with you. Let's actually talk. Let's not fight. Let's actually talk. Let's actually dialogue. That would be a peace situation against somebody who's hostile. It doesn't always work that way. You've seen the videos of the, of the women who are just screaming so they can, so they, no one could ever hear you talk. There are people outside preaching and they just scream, scream, and scream so no one can ever hear them. It's not going to be received all the time. 
But we also can't forget that we have a duty to Christ and we can't compromise on truth and we can't compromise on our own principles. Now real quick, because we have a lot to cover. If we believe blessed are the peacemakers is true, and I hope all of us here do believe that it is true, we must understand that the opposite takes place. It's, it's kind of the wonderful thing. There's this, there's this positive aspect, but there's also always this negative aspect. We can do this with the Ten Commandments as well. So, if blessed are the peacemakers, then it's equally true that cursed are the peace breakers. So we have to be diligent with all the things that cause division, that breaks peace. So we got to stand guard against bigotry and quarrelsome and uh, a, 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 quarrelsome, a quarrelsome spirit and, and a zeal that's not self-controlled. We got to really protect ourselves from all of that. We got to have our own blockers up. We got to have our own accountability up. Now we have to move on from the blessing side of the verse to the reward side of the verse, which is, for they shall be called sons of God. Literally, the children of God. And this is where we go back to what we learned about in Romans and the doctrine of adoption, because if we're paying attention and we're following along with Matthew, it is very similar to the formula that Paul has in Romans. Paul began with the sin side and then the justification side, this inward working. And so being poor in spirit is a miraculous gift from God. And because we, are, we, we, are, we, we uh, get this new outlook, we see ourselves for who we really are, we become these new creatures. We have been born again. And part of being born again is that we are adopted into the family of God. We are now the children of God. We are now the children of the God of peace which is why in our walk we become these peacemakers because we are representing our Father. And so it's a great blessing to begin with the poor in spirit because blessed are the peacemakers for they shall, for they sh um, shall be called the sons of God. Shall be called, not could be called, not would be called. You shall be called the children of God. It's all connected. When you begin at realizing your spiritual uh, condition and you work your way down, what you're working your way down to is that you will be called the sons of God. Now there's more. So let's look at uh, verses 10 through 12 together as they are they're one massive thought. It's one collective thought. There's a lot there, but it's one collective thought. So if you've got your Bibles open, let's look at verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophet who were, who were before you. The Christian life is a life of many paradoxes. This is why verse 9 is, meant to be read, is not meant to be read by itself. Because we read, blessed are the peacemakers. And our idea of peace comes from the 1960s hippie revolution. It really does. That's our concept of, of peace in American cultures. We're thinking of the, the 1960s hippie revolution. But verse 9 is not meant to be read with, the, with that in mind. That, that type of peace was not a concept in the days of Jesus. Verse 9 is meant to be read with these other three verses and the verses that preceded it, which is not a description of peace at all, is it? It is a reminder that you are not living in a peaceful world, that you are not amongst peaceful people. Our God is the standard for peace, not our 20th and 21st century Americanized idea of peace where we just all get along for the sake of getting along. 
And that sounds good, and that sounds nice. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if we all just got along, if we all just live and let live? But none of that, absolutely none of that, fixes the sinful condition of man. Me getting along with you will do nothing for your sin or your spiritual condition. Absolutely nothing. It is not bringing you any peace at all. Getting along with each other does not help these people one bit when it comes to the internal salvation of their souls. And so we come with a message. And it's not an easy message. Sure, mainstream evangelicalism has softened the message so much that when the true gospel is preached, honestly preached, people are so unaware of what they are hearing and they don't understand what they are hearing and so they accuse you of being this wrong type of Christian. They accuse you of preaching hatred or preaching wrath or condemnation or something. They want to accuse you of being unfaithful to Christ. They, have, they soften the message so much it's unrecognizable. People in the church get mad when they hear the gospel message. People get angry. People need to understand that Jesus is saying what he's saying for a reason. This persecution happens for a reason. And it's because we're not coming with the message that the world wants to hear. We don't come with the message that the world is going to receive so well. We're not coming with the message that people are excited to hear from us. We're coming with the message they detest. So our Lord says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. Those who are persecuted for holiness and purity. You guys got to remember, holiness, purity, righteousness, uh, sanctification, all of these words are connected. And the idea behind all of these words is purity, a holy purity. And Jesus makes it undoubtedly clear that they are part of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, if you have never heard this message before, if this is the first time somebody was coming up to you and telling you about Jesus, if it was the first time somebody was coming up to you and telling you about the Bible and they say, those who are persecuted are blessed. If you've never heard this message before, never heard of the Bible, never heard of, the, of Jesus, and I come up to you and I say, those who are persecuted are blessed. What would be your honest thoughts? Because it's such an outrageous statement. What are you saying? It is a blessing to be persecuted? How do I wrap my head around this? How is persecution a good thing? How do we reconcile these things together? And the fact of the matter is, is that we're not talking about something of this world. We're talking about something not of this world. Don't forget what that word blessed means. It means to have all the earthly weight lifted off of us. It means to have this transcendent happiness, this transcendent blessedness. I want you guys to really look at this verse and get an understanding that this is just one of those verses where we see the sinful human depravity of man where we see the curse of man, everything that is wrong within man is present in that one word, persecuted. And at the exact same time, everything that is good within Christ and all the blessings that he brings and all the richness and peace that can only come from him is in that same exact verse. And for the followers of Christ, it is only natural that the depravity of the world and the, the, the depravity of man meets the blessings of Christ. And the depravity of the world and the, de the depravity of within man and the blessings of Christ, they are going to meet and they meet within us. 
Now, does the world hate righteousness? Yes and no. Let's ask it a different way. Does the world hate justice? Not when it comes to themselves. They want justice, they demand justice in respect to when they have been wronged. My wallet has been stolen. Go get that guy. Somebody hurt my family member. Go get them. I have been wronged in some way. Somebody needs to answer for these crimes. They have no problem with that idea of justice. It's when they hear about them being on the receiving side of God's justice, then they begin to hate the righteousness that we are talking about. And that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. We come with the message of righteousness, which means we come with a message of justice. And that message is repent, you sinners, and receive the Lord Jesus, because upon faith in him, he, when you have faith in him, he is answered for your crimes. He is answered for your sins. He is answered for your unrighteousness by giving you righteousness. The just became the justifier, but apart from him, you will be at the receiving end of God's wrath. You will experience a wrath and a punishment like no other. And it's not a temporary punishment. It is an everlasting punishment. Some people get it in their minds. They go, how is it that I suffer for all eternity I suffer for all eternity for 40 years of sins, 50 years of sins, maybe 20 years of sins. Because you've sinned against the eternal one. You have sinned against the one who is everlasting. Therefore, the punishment is everlasting. Oh, how the world hates this message so intensely. Now this persecution that we're talking about, this does not mean everybody's going to suffer or be persecuted the same way. We have to take an honest look at that word persecution. It's easy for somebody to say, I'm persecuted because someone gave me a dirty look. That's real easy. But at the same time, it's easy to disregard a mild form of persecution because somebody else in the world is receiving a way worse type of persecution. The word itself means to pursue. And some of your translations may even say that in there. It may say it in verse 10 or 11. It's, it means to pursue. So that it's, 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 it's when anybody is pursuing you in a negative way for the sake of righteousness. That's what the word means. So we can't completely disregard all of what, what would be called minor persecutions or, or, or because of the negative things that are done to other people. If somebody is legitimately pursuing that person because of their faith, because of righteousness, then it is a form of persecution. We may not experience it on the same level as some of our other brothers and sisters who are experiencing it right now. And we may not experience it on the same level like the first 300 years of the Christian church. But we don't have to ignore the milder form simply because somebody else has it worse. As a matter of fact, maybe we should have been taking a stronger stand against those milder forms a long time ago. Maybe we should have stood up right then and there instead of having the attitude like, you know what? Somebody else has it worse than me. I can't complain. I didn't like the way I was treated, but you know what? It's not so bad, so I'm just going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm going to pretend like they didn't do this. And slowly but surely, we compromise on truth for the sake of peacemaking. So it is a general statement from our Lord, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And then in verse 11, he says, blessed are you. It's kind of a, it kind of has a, a, a general statement and then a very direct statement. I have no doubt that our Lord at this moment in verse 11, he's looking directly at the disciples who he knows are going to be faithful, who he knows are going to experience and endure this great personal persecution. 
And so our Lord right here, you see the language changed. Blessed are they, and then it gets real personal. And it's no longer a general statement. It is blessed are you. When people insult you and persecute you or pursue you and falsely say all kinds of evils against you because of me. So it's not just them pursuing you, it's when they insult you and it's when they make false statements, false evil statements against you or about you for his sake. Not people saying mean things about you because you're acting like a jerk. Not because people are saying these things about you because you're not friendly. You're not a friendly person. But they say these vile and wicked things against you because of our Lord. I say this because I don't want people walking around being rude to people and then they get a response back. and they're like, oh, I'm being persecuted because of my faith. When, our, when these things are done because of our love for Jesus, when this happens, the word from our Lord is what? Rejoice. Rejoice when these things take place because our reward is in heaven. You're not experiencing anything new. They've already did this to the prophets. You're not going to be on the receiving end of anything new. And folks, I'm going to tell you, hear those words. For those of you who are sitting here now, hear them. You're not going to experience anything new. We have so many faithful brothers and sisters who have already endured this in the past. And it's not just the prophets anymore. It is so many who have gone before us. But above all that, above the prophets who did this, above the Christians who have gone before us and have endured all this, they did this to our Lord and Master first. And they continue to do this to Him. Anytime God's people are attacked, anytime innocent blood is shed, they are continuously doing these things against God. But our Lord says... Rejoice. Your reward is in heaven. We're not going to have it right here, right now. And I don't know what the future holds for each and every one of us. I don't. I just don't know. I can speculate, but there's no honesty in speculation. It's just purely speculation. But there will be days where you are going to be so bitter because of what the world is doing. If you're not already bitter right now for what the world is doing. There will be days where you will be so down in the dumps at the wickedness and evil that is taking place if you're not already there. And there might be days where you are on the receiving end of the wrath of this world. And this world, through all this wickedness, through everything that's going on, may put you on the verge of breaking through those wicked actions. And, 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 they, they're, and you're on the verge of breaking because they are actively pursuing you. Like they have pursued our faithful brothers and sisters in the past. And the message is not, blessed are you, because if you get through this mission, you're going to get a Lamborghini. Blessed are you because as soon as you're done receiving this persecution, your bank account's going to have lots of money waiting for you. Blessed are you once you get through this season because, hey, there's a mansion I got and it's down the street. It's not blessed are you and then you will receive perfect health. It's none of that. It is no earthly blessing. It is no temporary blessing. We are told that our reward is in heaven, meaning we don't find the reward here on earth. There is no rewards for us here on earth. And when you're on that verge of breaking, you've just had enough of this place. I've had enough of everything that is going on. 
I'm not getting relieved at all in any way. What does our Lord tell us to do? He tells us to rejoice and be glad because your reward is not on earth. It's not some temporary thing that will dwindle away. Your reward is in heaven. And the reason our Lord is telling us to rejoice and be glad is because it is an objective truth, which means it remains true no matter what for the people of God. That truth exists no matter what. And you have to hold on to that when we are in positions of despair and when we are in a place in our heart where we are just so bitter and angry. You need to hold on to that objective truth. Your reward is not found here on earth. What is found here on earth are people who hate you for righteous sake. For the sake of righteousness. But rejoice. That's what our Lord tells us. Be glad. Because this is not the end for you. And this world will not be your end. And demonic forces will not be your end. All of that that you see going on, this will not be the end of you. But there is a reward in heaven. And it is great, our Lord says. Endure the persecution because the reward is in heaven. What is the reward? Jesus does not tell us, but I'm going to speculate, even though I just said I wouldn't speculate. I'm going to speculate. The reward is Jesus himself. Could be other things in addition to that. But the reward is going to be with the one who was on the receiving end of the very same persecution. It is the reward of being with the one who was on the receiving end of the one who took your very shame. To be with the one who revealed to you that you were naked and exposed before God. And he covered your nakedness and your shame by his blood. And all that we have done, all the shameful things before the, that we have done before the sight of our Lord, and we have done so many shameful things in the sight of our Lord. And all we have said, all the shameful things that we have said, and we have said some very shameful things before our Lord's holy years. And all that we have thought, and we have thought some very wicked and shameful things in our minds that scream so loud in the mind of our holy God. I believe that the great reward in heaven is to be with the one who answered for all of those crimes that we have committed, Jesus himself who took on all of our shame in action, in words, and in thought. That he himself is our great reward. And we will bask in glory where there will be no more sin, where there will be everlasting peace, and persecution will no longer be a thought or a scare on our mind. So many people talk about what heaven will look like and fine. I mean, streets of gold would be cool to look at. But it's not why I want to be there. And the size of some of the pearls we're reading about, that'd be cool. But it's not the reason why we want to be there. It's for Jesus himself. And there you have it, folks, the Beatitudes. These very quick and simple statements took us four weeks to get through. 
a section of scripture that people typically read within 15 seconds or less. And then forget about it. Don't give it another thought. We just spent four weeks on. And it's such a wonderful thing to look at when we look at the first four because we can, we, we can see this as the negative thing. And I talked about this earlier, that, that we had that positive negative thing. Um, you know, if we look at the law, when we do this with the Ten Commandments, we can apply this, uh, thou shall not murder. Well, then positive aspect of that is that we preserve life. But in the case of the first four Beatitudes, they are actually negative statements. Did you guys know that? And they are always the opposite of what the world is teaching us. And so we're looking at the life of the follower of Christ. That's what we're looking at. And what do we see? We see that they are not self-sufficient. We are not self-sufficient like the world is always demanding us to be. The world's always telling us to be self-sufficient, but we are poor in spirit. Do you guys see that negative? We are not self-satisfied, being satisfied with the, with the self like the world always wants us to be, that we need to have this self-satisfaction, -satisf that we need to be self-satisfied. We're not self-satisfied, but we are deeply in a state of mourning for our spiritual condition. We are not self-willed like the, like the world determines that we need to be, that we need to be these self-willed people. We need to be these go-getters all the time. We need to be assertive and aggressive uh, people, but we are the meek and gentle. Not the same as weak, as it takes more strength to be meek than it, than it does anything else. We are not self-righteous, contrary to what the world says, but the world is always self-righteous, always. Look at the good things I'm doing. Look at what I did, for goodness sake. We're coming close up to that season, the Christmas season, where we sing that. So be good for goodness sake. Self-righteousness, wrapped up in a Christmas song. That's what self-righteousness is. It's not doing good things to be noticed. I don't know how many videos I see on, on YouTube and social media where somebody's like, hey, we're going to do a good thing and we're going to give money to these homeless guys. I got blah, 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 X amount of cash and we're just going to walk around and give money to these guys. Well, why the cameras, buddy? Would you still do it like this if the cameras weren't rolling, if you weren't getting the popularity, the hits and everything? Self-righteousness. Some people do good things because it makes them feel good. It has nothing to do with anything else other than the feeling they get. It's self-righteousness. That's our world. It's not doing good things to be noticed or to pat ourselves on the back. We're not self-righteous, but we are hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of another, and that is Jesus himself. And so those first four we can look at as kind of a negative grace. That's what we can kind of look at it, a negative grace. The others we can look at as, as positive statements, so positive grace. Having tasted mercy, we want to show mercy. We want to be merciful in dealing with others. Having received a spiritual nature, we want to grow in love and holiness, not in impurity. So we want a pure heart. Having been entered into peace with God through Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross, we now wish to show peace to other people. The same type of peace that we have received. We want them to know the peace of God. We want them to stop waging war against God and come to peace with God. And that is ultimately what we mean when we say peacemaker. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says peacemaker. The gospel message brings this peace. It brings the peace to these people personally, but it also brings peace to us as one united group of people under one gospel mission, mission under one God. All united in one spirit. And then the last one is just a great reminder. Blessed are you when they pursue you. For you belong to the kingdom. So whatever may come during this world, especially during this election time that we're looking at, I don't, even know, I don't even know if I could call it election time anymore, this corruption time, hijack time. Well, I don't know what to call it. Hopefully history gives it a really funny name or a good name. But So whatever may come in this world during this time, we stand on the solid rock of Christ himself. 
And we look at these Beatitudes and we conclude that no matter what life throws at us, no matter what comes our way, no matter who is pursuing us, we belong to a real kingdom. And this real kingdom has a real king. His name is Jesus. And no politician, no government, no man has the authority over his people. They are all subjected under his lordship. All of these governing authorities are subjected under his lordship. And none of these people are getting away with anything. I have pity on these people. Woe to the man who goes to war with God. That is a losing battle. And such were all of us. We were once there too. So we show mercy and we bring him this peace. I want to close with this thought. It's, it's, it's more of an application. Keep Matthew chapter 5 in mind. Keep these Beatitudes in mind. And I want to share with you guys uh, a story, a historical story about Martin Luther. Martin Luther was very famous at this time. He was a wanted man, and he goes to get his hair cut at the barber shop, and the barber recognizes him. And Luther sits in his chair, and the barber was shaking. What do I do? And then Finally, he got done cutting Martin Luther, giving him a shave and everything, and he tells him, he goes, you know, I recognized you the moment you came in here. And... I didn't know what I was going to do, but now I just have one question. How do I pray? And Martin, he always has to do this. He always goes, yeah, let me think about that. (laughs) He, He never, I don't know if you guys know this about Martin Luther. He never actually gave direct answers immediately. Uh, very rarely, he always, he always kind of goes, let me think about it. And then it was always the next day or something. He came back with this just intense answer. And so that's what he did. He goes, let me think about that. And then he comes back. To the barber, I don't know if it was the next day, but it was, it was sometime after that. That point, he comes back and goes, he had a written note. And he goes, everything you need to know about praying is in this note. And so he opened it up. Liam, do you know where I'm going with this at all? No. And opened it up, and the instructions were the Ten Commandments, the um, the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. This is how you pray. And you take each line and make that the focal point of your prayer. So, our Father who is in heaven, your prayer is focused on our Heavenly Father and His dwelling place. Hallowed be thy name, Your prayer is focused on the holiness of God, how his holy name, and that's where you just keep going. You just keep going. You take time, and then you just focus on that one line that is the guiding force behind your prayer, and you just keep doing that. And then he said, do that with the Ten Commandments as well. And then he said, do that with the Apostles' Creed, as the Apostles' Creed was was pretty pretty big in uh, Luther's life. And so I believe in God the Father, Almighty and Maker of heaven and earth. That's your prayer outline. So you say, Father God, I believe in you. Thank you for saving me. You are this almighty creator. The the mountains exist. And you just go on. You just focus on that subject alone. And I'm going to take from Luther and say, add the Beatitudes. Add the Beatitudes. Thank God that he revealed to us that we are poor in spirit. So make that first line just one day. The blessing and the reward. Make that your prayer focus. Martin Luther wound up telling that barber with the three examples he gave. He goes, you spend one day on one line and just keep going on. And then when you're done with the Ten Commandments, go to the Lord's Prayer and just focus on one line. And each day you go on. And then when you're done with the Lord's Prayer, go to the Apostles' Creed. It's, which is a statement of faith. And so uh, just, just pray that statement of faith. And once you're done with that, and when you're done, go back. Start over. Because by the time you've gone through all of that, your prayer life has just changed. 
And going back to the very first commandment is going to be a different prayer altogether just through the radical change that has taken place within you. And that was Luther's advice on how to pray. And I'm adding the Beatitudes. Add the Beatitudes to that. Now that we have spent this time on there, and we see the great blessing that those who are poor in spirit mourn over that. And that we hunger and thirst for this righteousness and we will be satisfied. Have you ever sat and in your prayer life focused on the righteousness that was accomplished on your behalf? Prayed over the doctrine of justification by faith alone that you yourself are not actually righteous but righteousness was accomplished on your behalf for you? That our Lord lived for us and he kept the law for us? fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf, became our covenant head and led the way back for us. What wonderful things to pray. And ultimately what we're doing is we're praying God's word. So if you don't already have this area in your Bibles, highlighted, circled, written down, marked down, however you guys take notes, I got a specific Bible I, I, I take notes in, and then I got Bibles I won't take notes in because I want to keep them nice. And, and so uh, I got a Bible for every occasion. But um, that is my, that's my kind of encouragement of now that we have concluded the Beatitudes is use this as a, as a prayer life. Try it. Try it. Because it's a wonderful thing that we just learned from our Lord. And now the rest of the sermon is going to be him greatly unpacking that. We're going to see the truth of that in the rest of this gospel. The truth of these beatitude statements. What a great blessing. Let's pray. Father God, you have called us to be peacemakers in a hostile world. And the first way that we bring peace is by bringing your gospel that we expose to the lost that they are at war with you but they can have peace with you father i pray that we recognize the serious poor spirit condition of our country of of our politicians of everything that is around us even of our churches and we bring this message to them a message of repentance, and that your people stand firm once again. Help us, Father, to stand for righteous causes, pursuing holiness in our own personal lives, but, Lord, also pursuing it in the public eye. Father, I pray that our hearts are all changed, and we are transformed, Lord, and that our walk of sanctification is, is one of just much goodness, but one where we call people to repentance, that we see true peace take place. And when persecution comes, Lord, remind us of our great blessing, which is you yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.